Hi, in chapter number one, we're going to cover just some of the basic topics in diversity mid globalization. These talk about some of the metrics that we'll see uh, recurring throughout some of the major themes that we talk about, things like crude birth rate, death rate, population change, you know, migration, and how these can be quantitatively measured. So some of the things to keep in mind with class, and I, I've talked about this in my intro, just be cognizant of the uh, plagiarism policy uh, for the class. Ask me if you have any questions about what this entails. I don't accept late work. Um, also, uh, very open mind. So notify, notify me if you have any concerns, questions about the content, grading, policies, or whatever. Please let me know. Please be proactive as opposed to reactive. When we start talking about geography, it could be a number of different things to a number of different people. It's memorizing countries and capitals, making maps, doing GIS, which I do for a living, and learning about different places in the world. So some of these are qualitative, some of these are going to be quantitative. And you can see the spectrum of what human geography looks like here. So we have economic and economic geography. And you know, we can look at income, measure income like a macro or microeconomic class. And then we can look at the distribution of income or you know politics. You know, who did we vote for in the last election? How is that spatially? distributed. So there's a geographic component to this because geography at the end of the day is the study of where. And basically that's what we talk about. Geography has one common theme and involves the spatial extent. How features, phenomena, you know, tangible or intangible are organized about the surface of the earth. So in the textbook, these are pretty much the, the regions that we talk about. And we'll talk about some of the historical context behind them. Um, these days, we talk about the whole idea of, in, especially in 21st century geography, the idea of globalization. It's the increasing connections of people, places through economic, political, cultural change. So um, reorganization, the spread of culture. You know, I've been to you know, I've been to Iceland, and they have a subway up there. Geopolitical flux. You know, what are the different drawing of state boundaries. We're getting new and new countries every day. We had South Sudan a few years ago, East Timor in the late uh, early 2000s. We had Kosovo recently accepted as a country. And some of these other ones like Ossetia or Taiwan, what are they going to be? And then the whole idea of environmental disruption, local ecosystems. You know, basically the environment is the victim of our change. You know, in, in theory, you know, environmentalists, you know, we'd want to leave everything pristine. But how do we find that happy balance between between sustainability and providing for all seven plus billion people on the surface of the earth. Um, we have some pre, uh, pro globalization stances, you know, enhancing competition, uh, capitalism, that those are going to be recurring themes that we see throughout. Some of the critiques of globalization, it's not necessarily a natural process. The whole idea of trickle down, um, over exploitation of um, natural resources, the promotion of features or, or whatnot that we that we do kind of uh, discuss. So we can see, you know, some of these more developed countries, less developed countries. Previously, they used the first world, second world, third world. We, we're, we don't use those anymore. So we use, you know, developed and developing countries, more developed, less developed. So we're, we're kind of looking to, you know, use that taxonomy in this class here. Um, so when we talk about geography, there are five fundamental themes. Uh, we've got human environment interaction. We've mentioned this before. Um, systematics. Um, is there aerial differentiation between these? And what is uh, mankind's impact on the environment? The whole idea of regions. Okay. We have more distinct, less distinct regions. We have space and the place, the cultural landscape. Uh, we have the whole idea of regions. We have vernacular regions, formal regions, uh, boundaries based on a specific trait, uh, such, a, such as a, an actual valley based on a definition. Or, you know, I thought this was neat kind of at the bottom here. This was someone, I think they interviewed a number of people who, what do they think of the United States? So you can see Walter White lives down here somewhere, Stephen King country, the Midwest. You know, how do people interpret the United States? Okay, correctly or incorrectly, you know, they called Montana, Canada. So we can see a number of these different landscapes, and we also have the idea of scale. So large scale maps, small scale maps. Large scale maps basically means this number here is smaller. The fraction 1 over 5,000, or larger, this fraction 1 over 5,000 is 
a larger number than 1 over 500,000. So the actual large-scale map versus small-scale map. Large-scale, you can see um, less area, but in more detail. Um, so you can see individual buildings here on this college campus here. Okay, other things to, to ponder here, population and settlement patterns, uh, population change, and then these are some of the metrics that we will talk about and we will address in all the chapters. Rate of natural increase, uh, basically when people have people, okay? Every day on the surface of the earth, we get about 200,000 brand new people, about 300,000 births, 100,000 deaths, subtracting the two. We're adding 200,000 brand new people to the surface of the earth every single day. And so how these are expressed, crude birth rates and crude death rates. So we divide the gross number of births and deaths by total population and typically standardize it. Total fertility rates, um, how many women, um, how many children and women will statistically bear over a lifetime, usefulness. And then we have things like youth dependency ratio and elderly dependency ratio. We look at the percentage of people under the age of 15 or over the age of 65 in relation to the people between 15 and 65. The Earth's population pa passed 7 billion in the year 2011, and you can see the exponential increase of world population that, that we've seen. Uh, we can see the distribution of it, so um, we've got Asia, Latin America, Anglo-America right here, the distribution of population, but we can look at the crude birth rate right here, and this is the number of uh, births per 10 out oh, per 1,000 people. So you can see it's relatively high in Central America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Northern Africa, Middle East right here, um, and you can see where it's lower too. Okay, so these are the number of live births. Um, this is the crude death rates here. So you can see in Sub-Saharan Africa, these crude death rates are still relatively high. So you can see where they're high and where they're low. And they could be due for a number of reasons. Some of these could be due to the aging or graying population. Some of these could be due to diseases or whatnot, war. We can look at population pyramids to express the dynamics of population growth and decline. So we can see high growth okay, as we move up here on our y-axis. This is age versus population. So you can see high percentage of people, lower age. Then you can see this is for the United States. You can see our baby boomers here. This is from 2002. We can get some of these from the UN website that have uh, latest and greatest, but I, these are just examples of what we have here. This is Germany where the rate of natural increase is actually going down, where there are more people dying every day than being born. You can see Naples, Florida. You can see where there's a high elderly population. You can see Unalaska, um, Alaska here, where I think there's a lot of fishing here, so there's a lot more male population. So there's different dynamics. We can look at a po uh, population density. You can see where population is concentrated. And when we talk about the world's most populous countries, we're talking about China and India, one and two. Number three is United States, and number four is actually Indonesia. So we're looking at East Asia right here, or South Asia right here. This is where most of our world's population is. Uh, we can look at it by continent here and Asia here, far out numbers, everything else. We can look at demographic transition that I addressed before. So when we look at births minus deaths, we can look at phase one, phase two, phase three, and we can start to see as death rates go down, we can start to see what happens to our rate of natural increase. So we can, you know, we have pre-industrial, transitional, transitional, and industrial. And this is what a lot of countries are uh, these days right now, especially more uh, a lot of your developed countries here where you are birth rates and your death rates are relatively about you know, about the same so you have very little um, you have very little population change here okay um, so we have migration patterns where are people moving to we've got push factors what pushes you from a particular area what pulls you to a particular area so in the United States people are moving due to you know in the United States not particularly civil strife but you see this examples in Syria not Iraq but environmental degradation unemployment uh, that drive people from places and what are better services cost of living so you can see regions throughout the world, because when we talk at a worldwide scale, basically people, you, there's only one way you can come in, there's only one way you can go out for the world. So when we talk about that population change, that 200,000, but on a regional basis, you can definitely see it's much higher in North America, Western Europe, Oceania, especially Australia, New Zealand, where people are being increased. So we can look at the thousands and the actual rate. Uh, this talks about urbanism. 
Okay, so we can look at world urbanization. So you can see where the higher percentage of people are li living in cities or places that we dictate as urban areas. And in the city, we've got the urban structure, the urban form, form over urbanization. And these days, we've got a century of cities. So right now, it's about 50 50. In the United States is about 75 25. So 75% of the people live in urban areas. There's lots of different ways that we can measure or you know, use the term urban. Um, but right now in the world, it's about 50-50 or so right now. Um, and so you can just see, assume that this is Damascus, Syria. And you can see some of these you know, cities here that you know, take on some, you know, some of the shapes of the, the world around them. Uh, we've got geography of tradition and change. So this shared way of life, um, that's the word culture. So to me, those are some of the intangible ways of life. I was recently in Italy. I turn on the TV. What are they showing on TV? You know, sports. They've got soccer. They've got bike. You know, bicycling. They've got volleyball. And so I'm not watching football. I'm not watching baseball. I'm not watching, you know, basketball. I always thought that was kind of interesting. So these are just the different components of culture. Okay, when cultures collide, uh, cultural nationalism, cultural imperialism, where we pass culture uh, some way, you know. Uh, it, it, sometimes in kind of violent ways, uh, cultural diffusion, the spread of culture traits or complexes. So these talk about some of the ways that culture spread and what are some of the barriers to it. And then the whole idea of language, you know, how do we basically speak to people? OK, so official languages, which may be different, uh, you know, places like Mozambique or Angola, the official language is Portuguese because it was originally settled by the Portuguese, but not necessarily a lot of people speak it. And to me, you know, having you know traveled through Europe, a lot of speak people speak English, so that's kind of good here. So you can kind of see the uh, distribution of languages in the different language families throughout the world. We have different religions, so these are the distribution of religions. So a lot of times in areas like you know, northern Nigeria or the Middle East, where some of these religions mix, you know, basically a couple of different religions claim uh, claim different people, uh, uh, claim different countries, or different countries are, are claimed by different religious groups. This is where we have a lot of our our strife that we see, you know, especially places like Israel or northern Nigeria, or whatever. We also have nation states. You know, we have the whole idea of geopolitics. A nation is a group of people with shared cultural elements, language, religion, Kurds. And then we have states, basically a political entity. OK, uh, in March of 2018, I was actually in Vatican City, which is literally about a 100 acre country surrounded entirely by Rome. But you can see some of the, you know, this is um, uh, Yugoslavia and basically it was a bunch of culture groups put together at the end of World War One, and then you can see what happened to it you know in the 80s where it's broken back down into your you know your Bosnian Croatian Serbs so Slovenians and whatnot here uh, the Kurds we've heard about them a lot in the news um, in the last 15 years with Iraq because they're a large culture group in northern Iraq but they also transcend into Iran Turkey Syria, maybe a little bit into Armenia and the Caucasus region. Okay, we have borders, so you can see some of the borders that we have here, ethnographic borders, and some of the issues that we've dealt with in the past is that is that people have drawn the borders with little regard to the ethnographic um, divisions there. Okay, so we have a number of different culture groups that are just placed within there. And you can see this in Sub-Saharan Africa with Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Lesotho has kind of carved itself out. So colonialism, these talk about colonialism, global terrorism, which we hear about these days, um, economic and social development, wealth and poverty. Some of the indicators we have is GNI or GNP, gross national income. So it's just the, the total value of incomes and goods. Uh, for a particular country divided by number of people. Okay, and then we have this inequality flux that we've been seeing a lot lately, and it's been increasing here. So we've got a lot of these countries where the schism between rich and poor is getting higher and higher. We have supranational, uh, international and supranational organizations. Uh, we have core industrial zones here. So you can see we're part of one here at Germana Community College that runs up the quarter of Route 95 all the way up through Boston. 
Um, indicators of social development, more things like mortality rate, life expectancy, uh, secondary school enrollment. We're going to look at a lab later in the semester that looks at human development index, which is just a, a calculation of those scaled to a value of 1. Um, infant mortality rates. So you can see where infant mortality rates are extremely high here. Uh, 150, one out of every six kids or so in these countries here don't make it to their first birthday. So these are just some of the metrics that we've talked about here. We're going to hear about and see a lot of these metrics as we move further and further as we cover these regions.